Hi, and welcome to the A16Z podcast. I'm Hannah, and today's episode is a hallway-style conversation in honor of back-to-school season on the economics of parenting, but not in quite the way you'd think. So much of the discussion around parenting and tech today is about the use of specific products or devices. So in this conversation, we wanted to broaden the context and instead explore what it means to use economics as a framework for understanding the nature of parenting. For example, using game theory to think about parenting in terms of our interactions, our choices, incentives, but also the way broader economic environments change parenting styles in different cultures. And last but not least, how tech might be impacting all of that. The first voice you'll hear is Kevin Zolman, professor at CMU, a game theorist and philosopher and co-author of the recent book, The Game Theorist's Guide to Parenting. And the second voice is Fabrizio Zilabati, a macroeconomist at Yale, working on a book called Love, Money, and Parenting. One of the real central struggles for parents, I think, is making this balance between, you know, what makes life easy today, what gets your kid to stop crying or to stop fighting with you or whatever, and what makes a good kid in the long run. You know, you can give them an extra cookie now and they'll stop bugging you for it, but also you're not teaching them good eating habits. We try to find ways of planning and designing their interactions with their kids so that they can get their kids to do things that are both in the long term interest of the of the child, but also make life easy on the parents. And that's where game theory comes in. And that's exactly where game theory comes in. Yeah. We describe game theory as the science of strategic interaction. And the idea here is that anytime you've got two different people whose interests aren't exactly the same, you know, you have a child who wants another cookie for dessert and a parent who wants their kid to finish their vegetables. And so one of the focuses of game theory has been on how can you create strategic interactions, games, between two different individuals so that both individuals can come out in a way that's good for both of them. Can you give us an example of the ways in which that that tends to play out in sort of real concrete daily parenting dilemmas. You're driving on vacation. The kids are harassing one another in the back seat. And dad turns around and says, if you guys don't behave, we're canceling the vacation. (laughs) Uh, Right. Which is you're never supposed to do because then inevitably it happens. And what do you do then? Yeah, exactly. Every parent knows you're not supposed to do it, but they all, (laughs) but everyone (laughs) finds themselves doing it nonetheless. In game theory terms, this is called a a non-credible threat. And the reason that it's a non-credible threat is because the kids, if they're sophisticated enough, and most kids are, will realize that mom or dad doesn't want to cancel the vacation any more than the kid does. Right. You're in the car. It's packed. You're on your way. There's no way. Exactly. And by not designing the interaction in the right way, you end up putting yourselves in a no-win situation. Mm -hmm. The kids have called your bluff. You don't want to cancel the vacation, but you also don't want to establish a reputation with your kids that your threats mean nothing. And so one of the things that game theory teaches, you want to design punishments or rewards for your kids that are possible for you to follow through on and that you want to follow through on. So instead of going to the amusement park in the morning, maybe you'll go to a a museum. That's a threat that's credible because the kids know you'll want to go to the museum, but that you would be happy to follow through on if the time comes. Fabrizio, as a macroeconomist, your work kind of telescopes out and looks at parenting from that macro level. In your work, you talk about, just to set a little context, the three major parenting styles, authoritarian, where parents really strongly determine what's allowed and isn't and don't give kids much opportunity for feedback or backtalk, really. Permissive parenting, which is really the opposite, where parents give kids lots of freedom and choice and even sometimes kind of allow them to be the leaders. And then authoritative, which is a kind of positive middle ground and the way that we're, I think, being told now to parent where parents are in charge, but allow kids some agency as well. So how do those different styles play out in different situations and different contexts? We think that uh, parents have some common uh, goals uh, in different parts of the world, but uh, that the environment and the constraints they are subject to are different, especially the changes in uh, economic inequality. Yes. And we look at uh, variation across uh, nations over time. So comparing the 70s uh, with uh, the 90s or or the turn of the century, comparing Sweden uh, with the United States uh, uh, or China. So on the one hand, we think that most parents want their children uh, to be uh, happy 
this uh, uh, altruistic concern. At the same time, you know, happiness is a, is a concept that uh, refers to the present and to the future. So you can have a very happy child and a less happy adult, depending also on some choices that are made during childhood or uh, when a youngster. So we postulate that parents somehow think the good for their children, but to, with, a, with a stronger emphasis on their future. Children also care about their own future, but uh, somehow they are a bit more present-oriented. And that's the part we call paternalism. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why parents try to uh, influence the choice or the views uh, of the world of children. Interesting. So you're describing the interaction of parenting basically as this combination of paternalism and altruism, but really having to do with whether you're thinking about the now or the future. I mean, but aren't those different ways of seeing things? Basically, kids really thinking about the now and parents thinking about their kids' future and what's best for the future. Isn't that kind of just the definition of parenting? There is uh, an element of uh, common interest between parents and children, you know, to the drive to success. And then there is an element of dissonance and the diversity of views where parents uh, uh, care more for their children when they will be adult. Whether it's more the economic part of it or other way of enjoying uh, life, when we think about parent and children, if we think that parent and children value them differently. So if both parents and children think that, uh, you know, being a great painter is a, is, a, is a good thing, this type of conflict does not arise. It's really about whether they're aligned with their children or have a different point of view. Absolutely. So where do these two ways of interacting meet then? This sort of large picture of parents and children being aligned or not about the future and the now, and the more micro daily strategic interactions that Kevin described? Game theory typical, uh, stipulates that uh, uh, payoffs are essentially given. Cultural economics uh, have tried to put a new level of elaboration on that. So the idea that uh, one of the investments uh, an agent can make is in, uh, in changing somehow the payoff of the other. We reason that way when we try to persuade children. Uh, you know, the children are, are fighting on the back of the car. Another way some parents uh, act is uh, uh, to try to convince day-by-day uh, -day children that uh, fighting in the back of the car is not worthy uh, and it has some negative uh, moral uh, aspect. If you go back uh, uh, one century or more, my grandparents, my grand-grandparents' generation, most of the interaction between parents and children uh, was regulated by restrictions. So parents were telling children what they could do and what they could not do. We think they were doing it uh, on the ground, again, on this altruism and paternalism. Right, the same, the same driving factors, but it was coming out another way. One of the changes that we have seen in the way in which... Uh, uh, parents strategically influence uh, the way uh, children behave is is dr is driven by this uh, change in the in the system of incentive and also uh, in uh, how much control and monitor parents can exercise. We think that this is one of the reasons why uh, a certain way of authoritarian parenting style has declined. Uh, corporal punishment we see it decline uh, uh, everywhere in the world. One of the reasons we think is that its effectiveness uh, is lower in, in the new uh, environment, in the new economic environment. Oh, interesting. Not it's not because our cultures have changed, but because it's actually less effective in, in, our, in what we want the outcome to be? Yes, there is a two-way interaction between culture and economics. Once a certain set of behaviors uh, become more or less acceptable, then they become also ingrained. Kevin, do you see these parenting styles also in sort of how you think about your game theorist lens of looking at parenting interactions? Or I guess a bigger way to ask that question is, what do you see the role of culture playing in these particular dilemmas and conflicts that parents and children have? I think culture plays a huge role. I think that, you know, the fact that children are in a lot of respects much more independent of their parents uh, these days than than they were in the, you know, much, much distant past. Do you really think does... so? I feel like they're actually less independent. They don't roam around town on their bikes the way we did when we were kids. They've all got phones. We know where they are all the time. Well, they're they're more independent in the following way, let me say, which is that there's a lot of interactions that kids have where the parents aren't present. You know, a century or two centuries ago, kids weren't going to school. They weren't leaving the house. They weren't interacting over at friends' houses as much. One of the fundamental problems that modern parents face is the fact that 
in some respects, kids know more about what's going on in the kids' lives than the parents do. So, you know, you, your child uh, uh, is doing poorly in school and comes home and says, uh, I'm working as hard as I can, you know, but I just can't manage to do well. Well, here are parents face a real struggle because on the one hand, if, if the child is deceiving them, is really not working that hard, the parent would like to do various things to encourage the child to work harder. On the other hand, if the kid really is working as hard as they can, and this is just the best that they can do, it's counterproductive for the parent to criticize them for getting a C or a B or whatever. Well, and I'm really glad you bring this up because I wanted to ask, where does truth and fiction fit into these models? You know, are we are we assuming that we have a basic understanding of the facts? And are we actually assuming that children are rational players here in these strategic interactions? I, I definitely think kids are rational. But one of my favorite stories, I, I've got it secondhand, but was of an economist's uh, son who ran into the store and came out holding two candy bars and said, uh, Dad, can I have two candy bars? And Dad says, no, 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 you can only have one. And the kid gets this giant smile on his face because, of course, he only wanted one, but he knew that if he asked for two, the right. compromise would be at one. Right, right. Kids are sophisticated strategic reasoners in figuring out how to get what they would like to from their parents. And that truth and and lies fits into that then because they're using it ultimately to get what they want. Absolutely. I mean, every parent has to go through the struggle of teaching their kid why lying is wrong. Because kids will figure out at some point that they can get what they want by deceiving their parents. That it's useful. That lies and are useful. useful. Kids have access to all sorts of information that parents can't observe directly themselves, right? All parents here is the fight between the siblings in the next room. They don't know who started it because they weren't there. In situations where the parents are worried that their children might be facing an, in, uh, an incentive to deceive them, how can parents sort of design the social interaction to minimize the consequence of that deception or the incentive to do it? If in the end, uh, parents and children had exactly the same view of the world, there would be no game. So we, we go to the root of what makes uh, uh, parents and children see things differently. The interesting thing is that love that creates a common interest. Oh, that is really interesting to think of the emotion of love as actually serving as a kind of common ground that aligns these interests and these different goals. Education is also a powerful instrument for parents uh, in exercising some uh, uh, control through uh, influence and moral suasion on children. So if parents want to try to change uh, the payoff in the game, so the, they, they try to change uh, the way uh, children behave by making them think different in the game, well, uh, more educated ma parents may have uh, uh, access to uh, higher sophistication. But that's not to say that less uh, uh, educated parents are irrational. They may just uh, have more limited set of instruments at disposal. Which comes to the point also why uh, education is, is negatively correlated uh, uh, with punishment, with corporal punishment. And one of the uh, answers is that, uh, well, the set of strategy that uh, uh, more educated parents can play is more sophisticated. And uh, that leaves uh, somehow uh, parents who have less time and uh, lower education with uh, uh, more uh, uh, simple way of intervening. I thought it was really interesting that you said that we know less of what kids are experiencing than we once did, because I think in a lot of ways it feels like we actually know far more, right, with the with the technological tools and the way kids use technology, the way parents use technology, um, GPS data and texting and being always in touch and the way that schools, you know, send home information. There's there's ways in which we know a lot more. So how do you see that impact 